Hi, I'm Manika Raman Wilms, and you're listening to The Decibel from The Globe and Mail. As the war in Ukraine continues, President Vladimir Zelensky is making direct appeals to other countries for help. On Wednesday, he spoke remotely, via video, to the U.S. Congress. In his speech, he asked the U.S. for a no-fly zone over Ukraine to help the country fight back against the Russian invasion. And as the leader of my nation, I am addressing the President Biden. You are the leader of the nation, of your great nation. I wish you to be the leader of the world. Being the leader of the world means to be the leader of peace. Thank you. As Zelensky made his speech, Russia continued its attack across Ukraine. The encircled port city of Mariupol was still in Ukrainian hands, but being bombed relentlessly. Zelensky's address to Congress followed his Tuesday speech to Canada's parliament, but it was different in a few ways. Since the U.S. is a global leader, the stakes were high for Zelensky to try and influence the country to help in the hopes that other nations would follow. And I think that Zelensky feels he's in that position. He's in that kind of inflection point between holding out and um, perhaps capitulating, although I don't think he's the capitulating type. But uh, I think that the Russians may be in for a, a long and hard time. David Shribman is a contributing columnist at The Globe and a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist based in Pittsburgh. Today, he'll help us understand what action the U.S. is taking, what it's not willing to do, and how this war is prompting some reflection on America's place in the world. This is The Decibel. David, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, it's always a pleasure to be with you, Manika. Why is the U.S.'s response to the war in Ukraine so important? Well, there are are moments in history where one country seems to have a leadership role in its own conceit. The United States sometimes refers to itself as the indispensable nation. It's that very uh, conceit and that very um, sense of destiny that so irritates Moscow and Beijing, and that is playing a role in this particular conflict as well. I think that this is a a fight not only about the destiny and future of um, Ukraine, but also about the destiny and future of the West and of the globe itself. And um, Moscow and Beijing are asking whether and why the United States should have this kind of role, why the West should have this kind of role. Hmm. So that's part of this whole problem and conundrum and tragedy. We are also hearing, we talk a lot about NATO when we're talking about this war, which is the, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. What is the U.S.'s role within NATO? The United States is the straw that stirs the NATO drink. It it has kind of at the commanding heights of NATO, and um, its will often is congruent with or leads the will of NATO. I want to ask you about Ukrainian President uh, Volodymyr Zelensky's address to U.S. Congress on on Wednesday. He gave a speech there, uh, and and I wanted to ask you what really stood out from, from his remarks there. Well, it was one of the most remarkable speeches ever given in the United States Congress, even though it was given remotely. Mm. There are uh, several touchstone speeches in American life. More recently, that's a speech that uh, President Roosevelt gave after Pearl Harbor, a speech that President Lyndon Johnson gave uh, to try to win support. He ultimately did win support for the uh, Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, And this was a speech that I think pushed every button. And these buttons were pushed with great skill uh, and with great poignance. And I don't think it's going to be soon forgotten. Uh, We don't change many minds with speeches uh, in Congress. I'm not sure this one changed any minds. It surely reinforced minds. But um, this was one of the great speeches ever delivered. And it was amplified by a remarkable video, poignant, moving, tragic, unforgettable. Can you briefly describe for us what was that video about, and and I guess why was it so powerful as well? 
It has some of the elements of a Disney-like travelscape in which it showed, if it were from Canada, it would show the wheat fields of uh, the prairies and the mountains of British Columbia and um, the coastline uh, of the Maritimes. And um, he did the equivalent, the Ukraine equivalent of all of that. And then he mixed it with kind of a then and now series of images of these magnificent places being destroyed by the Russian assault. And then he showed another extremely powerful contrast between happy Ukrainians, almost um, festive Ukrainians, uh, and then similar people being slaughtered by Russian airstrikes and uh, armored barrages. And so the contrast between those two things uh, was immensely effective and indeed unforgettable. And I don't think anyone who was sitting in that chamber or was watching that on the television or on their computer screens will soon, if ever, forget it. On, on Tuesday, he also addressed the Canadian Parliament. What did you notice as, I guess, the key differences between what he said to Canada and, and what he said to the U.S.? His speech to Ottawa, I th- in Ottawa, I think, was a speech uh, for support uh, and for solidarity. The speech in um, Washington was for arms and a no-fly zone. When he spoke in Ottawa directly to the Prime Minister and referred to him as Justin. Prime Minister, dear Justin, members of the government. The informality of it all and the familiarity of it all had a power that was different from the power he used and employed in his speech in Washington a day later. Why is Zelensky directly addressing foreign governments at this point now? What's, what's the goal here? Because he can't do this alone, uh, although he is doing it alone and doing quite a terrific job. Uh, but he knows that ultimately the force of Russian arms, 200,000 Russian soldiers, and um, a near limitless supply of Russian aircraft and missiles is an irresistible force. Uh, Right now we're watching the uh, 21st century version of the Winter War of 1939-1940, where Finland heroically held out for a long time, but ultimately wasn't able to prevail. And I think that um, Zelensky feels he's in that position, he's in that kind of inflection point between holding out and um, perhaps uh, capitulating, although I don't think he's the capitulating type. But uh, I think that the Russians may be in for a, a long and hard time. Zelensky said on Tuesday that Ukraine must accept that it will never join NATO. Why do you think he made that statement? Well, that, that was a big departure. And that was, I think, an important moment. And I think that that foresees a potential place for um, an agreement to see some of these hostilities. I mean, even just Wednesday morning, though, it looks like there are kind of rudimentary plans here between Russia and Ukraine to maybe end the war, some neutrality plans that are in the works here. Is, I guess, is this a sign of what you're saying, that this is how it's going to end? Well, I would, I would say to you, uh, from your lips to Putin's ears, let's hope that that's the case. Hmm. But I mean, uh, both sides are going to have some things that they're not going to want to relinquish. Putin has strong ideas about what he wants, and Zelensky has strong ideas about what he's not going to give. And um, between those two is the distance that these talks would have to travel. What was the relationship like between the U.S. and Russia, um, and particularly also between Biden and Putin, before this this war in Ukraine started? Well, the relationship between the United States and Russia has always been a very interesting one. Uh, Putin has regarded the death of the Soviet Union in 1991 as the greatest tragedy uh, of the 20th century. I think that we might regard the Russian Revolution of 1917 and the Nazi ascendancy of 1933 as the uh, greatest tragedy of, of that century. And in that difference is the difference between Biden, who is a thoroughly conventional American figure, um, and Putin, who has this view of, the, of Russia and its um, destiny and decline, and the new destiny. And I think that's where we are. We have a um, conventional American president who's suspicious of Russia, and a um, unconventional world leader, uh, Vladimir Putin, who is um, contemptuous of the global order 
the United States and the West established after 1945. And neither the twain shall meet. When they did meet briefly in the Nixon Ford, you know, years and thereafter, it was uh, fraught and tentative, and now it's fraught and deadly. There's also this recent history with Russian interference in, in America's 2016 election. Well, there's that, yes. How, yeah, how is that affecting, I guess, how America's responding to what's happening now? The uh, attempts uh, by Russia to affect uh, the 2016 and 2020 elections uh, is a uh, sore point here. It's part of the tension between the two countries, and um, we find it unforgivable. So Trump was elected in 2016. And while Trump was president, Zelensky had a part in Trump's impeachment in 2019. Can you tell us about that? Well, yeah, uh, the president of the United States called up the president of Ukraine and said, uh, uh, please do me a little favor. Would you uh, investigate Joe Biden a little bit? And Zelensky was reluctant to do it. And the president made suggestions that he would withhold uh, U.S. uh, military assistance unless he did it. And um, thus began a long, tortuous, and ultimately um, unsuccessful effort to remove the president from office. He was impeached. You remember that the uh, House impeaches and the Senate tries. Uh, He was impeached in the House. Uh, He was acquitted in the Senate. And that was the end of that for a while. Now we look back on any question involving giving arms to Ukraine in a different light, with different perspective. And it's odd that the um, in the very chamber where this was debated and where the president was impeached, it was Vladimir Zelensky who gave this speech to rally Americans to democracy. Let's talk about President Joe Biden then and, and his response to this war in Ukraine. How has he been approaching the situation? Well, let's remember, first of all, that, that President Biden, while not an intellectual, is not an ingenue. This is a, a guy who spent 36 years on Capitol Hill and um, in a strong position in the, uh, in the Senate uh, and deeply involved in foreign affairs, foreign aid, and uh, military questions. So he approaches this with some sophistication. And I think that uh, Vladimir Putin very likely underestimated uh, President Biden, thinking that he was kind of a, um, a loquacious, undisciplined character. He is a loquacious, undisciplined character, but when it comes to this realm, the president knows what he's talking about and has has experience and has a worldview, uh, conventional though it is, but it is a a worldview more firmly established than that of uh, President Reagan or uh, George W. Bush or uh, Obama or Trump. What tools has Biden employed so far uh, against Putin? Well, he's given military aid and some more military aid, which he uh, unveiled shortly after the uh, Zelensky speech. An additional $800 million in assistance. That brings the total of new U.S. security assistance to Ukraine to $1 billion just this week. These are the uh, Of course, there's the been uh, sanctions. He's singled out the Russian oligarchs. Uh, he's rallied uh, the country and parts of the world against uh, uh, Russia. He's established this um, Maybe this is his most fundamental achievement, has established this as a conflict of uh, conscience and of consequence. And so I think that that's a big contribution. He can't, I don't think, make much more. His toolbox is empty. What about U.S. internal politics here? What do Republicans want to see from from the U.S.'s response? The Republicans, generally speaking, would like to see uh, Biden fail, though not in this particular uh, realm. You know the phrase that politics stops at the water's edge, uh, politics stops at the uh, border of Ukraine and Russia in this particular case. And so I think that the uh, Republican uh, response from a conventional Republican president uh, would be very little difference. This must be a bit of a, a tightrope to walk, though, for some Republicans, because, of course, the previous president, Donald Trump, was quite open about his admiration for Russian President Vladimir Putin. How are Republicans squaring their support for a president who very recently just admired Putin and, and, and would express his admiration for Putin with this current situation? Well, they're, they're ignoring it. Now, there's a wonderful story involving uh, Governor Roosevelt's campaign for president in 1932. When he came to, right here to Pittsburgh, where I'm sitting now, he came to Pittsburgh and he spoke about a balanced budget. And within a year, he was doing everything he could to produce a budget that wasn't balanced. And um, one of his aides, Sam Rosenman, I think it was, said to him as this budget was spiraling out of control, Mr. President, 
What are you going to do about that, say, about that speech in uh, Pittsburgh, about the balanced budget? And uh, President Roosevelt said, I'll simply say I was never in Pittsburgh. So what you're saying is... The Republicans will simply simply forget and have simply forgotten or ignored what President Trump had to say about Putin and about some of this stuff. Doesn't that seem like a, a pretty obvious contradiction, though, or a pretty obvious issue with if you have people who are expressing support for this person and, and now are, are, are saying something or, or ignoring the fact that they did that? I don't think contradictions in politics are particularly unusual. And uh, this one is as unremarkable as some of the other beauties. Is this war in Ukraine, is this a test of the U.S.'s relevancy in, in the current world order? Sure, it certainly is a test of the, I mean, it's a test of Ukraine's forbearance, right? It's a test of um, Beijing's alliance, brief as it is, with Russia. And it's a test of American leadership as well. Now, this is a test for which there is no particularly alternative outcome. We know what the United States is going to do here. It's going to do X and Y, but not Z. It's going to give arms. It's going to have an embargo. It's going to make things tough. It's going to seize assets. It's not going to go to war. So it may be a a test where everybody knows the answer. David, should this conflict be considered World War III? Well, it involves a lot of countries. It involves, at this stage, more countries than were involved for arms or other, other means at this similar time in World War II. But I actually asked that question, but I can't really answer it yet. We don't really know. And let's hope that whatever this is, it doesn't have the deadly consequences of the World War III that doomsdayers and other serious scholars, serious students of foreign affairs, uh, have projected with a nuclear exchange between these two superpowers. What would change to make this very clearly World War III from your perspective? Direct engagement of American and NATO forces with uh, Russian forces. And I guess, hence, NATO's and the West's reluctance then to get involved even with a, a no-fly zone. Yeah, and it's, it's not an imprudent decision on their part. It's not a good one for Ukraine, but it's, it's a rational one for the West. David, thank you so much for taking the time to walk us through this today. And thank you for asking me difficult questions that I, in many, in many junctures, really had a hard time answering because the questions are so hard and the answers are so hard to come by. That's it for today. I'm Manika Raman-Wilms. Our intern is Rose Danen. Our producers are Madeline White and Cheryl Sutherland. David Crosby edits the show. Kasia Mihailovich is our senior producer and Angela Pachenza is our executive editor. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll talk to you tomorrow.